That information was not available. When I asked about each nation and region, that information wasn't available. When I asked how much additional resources were allocated to locating these, uh, the child trust funds, uh, the information wasn't available. Can he supply that information here today? I'm grateful to the intervention from the um, member from the Vale of Clewet. And in terms of regional and income distribution or breakdown of child trust funds, this information is published by HMRC and discriminates between region and county uh, and whether additional contributions were made. No income distribution data is collected by HMRC. Um, I'm very happy to look into this further. If there's anything more that I can give him, I will write to him with that information. But if I um, get back to the, the point about looking to the future, there are around 6 million child trust funds that have not yet been transferred to junior ISAs. The first of these will mature next September, and thereafter 55,000 accounts will mature every month up until 2029. And what young people choose to do with their money is ultimately a matter for them. But we want them to be engaged in the process so that they can make the best decision for their individual circumstances. I'm very happy to give way. I mean, I explained to the Minister that the problem is you can't use the government website to access the account if you haven't got a payslip or a P60 or a passport. So could the Minister please address that specific point? Because hundreds of thousands of young people will be in that situation. The key, the key point is, how does an individual child know what they've got? And the, the, the allegation that the Honourable Lady is making is that this money is lost. It's not lost, it's just that the individuals haven't come to the point when they can engage with it, which happens when they get a late letter from, uh, to, with their national insurance number aged 16. At age 16, they are then allowed to make a decisions around the investment choices within that fund. At 18, they are able to access it. And the, now let me just finish my point, and then I'll give way. So the issue is, where if they get that letter at 16, which is at the time when they're able to uh, uh, start making decisions about it individually, they will get that letter as part of the national insurance. So if the, if the suggestion, which I think has been made, is that actually um, the... the, the um, uh, Share Foundation should interrogate DWP data, cross-reference it with HMRC, and somehow uh, write to these individuals. They are not in a position that, well, I've, that point has been made in, in other forums, but I am, I'm just trying to respond completely to the, to the points that have been raised in general. But I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. Thank, I thank the Minister for giving way. Um, what plans does the Minister have to encourage eligible parents and um, children when they turn 16 to access this money. Isn't it a responsibility of the government to be doing some kind of public awareness campaign to say, hey, look, here's your, here's your, you know, your, your investment that the government made for you. This is how you access it. And let's actually make this a can-do exercise. I think, I think the key point is this money is for children to have uh, access to when, uh, when they're 18, but being able to in influence decisions on from the age of 16 when they're paying tax and they have a national insurance number. They will gain that access mechanism when they secure their national insurance number. Now, as I said, the Honourable Lady made a point about the, the way that is depicted on the form when they get their national insurance number, but that provides the, the key to unlock awareness and access to the fund that has been invested for them. Does the Honourable Lady want to... Uh, sorry, I, think the minister, I mean, I don't like to sort of um, denigrate my former profession, but I don't think the Minister's been very well briefed. Because according to the Share Foundation, the lost accounts of the most wealthy, number 54,000, of the middle income, number 560,000, and of the poorest, number 444,000. Now, that isn't of those families where the child is already 16 to 18. That includes all the families. And, the, and, and what it means is the addressee has gone away. You don't know whether the address you have got is the right address for this group of people. The point I'm making is that all individuals, no matter what their background, 
will gain access to the funds at the point when they can gain their national insurance number by reference to the letter that's been provided. And uh, I, I, I have had extensive conversations with my officials, and I note the, re the reference the Honourable Lady made to uh, bureaucrats. I mean, I, she worked for over 20 years in the Treasury. I have the highest regard for them and the accuracy of the material that they've given me. Um, no, funds, uh, no funds or accounts have been lost. All child trust funds have been managed by child trust fund providers, either by the original provider with whom an account was set up or a subsequent provider where the funds have been transferred. There are 69 providers currently managing child trust funds and the Share Foundation's analysis appears to be based on accounts held with just one provider. That's the Share Centre, representing only 1.5% the number of accounts. And if the Honourable Lady wants to contradict that in terms of the extrapolation of that data to the whole of them, I don't know. But the government is working together with all industry to encourage, encourage uh, child trust fund holders to re-engage with their accounts. And as I say, we have developed an online tracing mechanism and recently amended the National Insurance Notification Letter to 16-year-olds to include that reference to child trust funds. That happened in January of this year to take account of the points that were being raised. And any account holders who are unable to retrieve their account details online are encouraged to contact HMRC directly. And last year's well, budget... Sorry, yeah, very happy to give my... I've just explained to the Minister that to get through to the website, you have to have these other documents, documents which, by definition, 16-year-olds don't have, can't have. So it's not a system that's working. The Minister needs to rethink how this website works. Well, I don't think raising a voice in an aggressive manner is going to help anyone. I mean, I've just set out the government's position. I've explained the detail of the provision. She's extrapolated some figures from one piece of analysis of one of the providers, which isn't, uh, I don't think, a reliable way of carrying on. And I've told her the action we took in January this year in, and it's not just about the online portal, it's also about being able to call up HMRC. And last year's budget included a commitment to consult on draft regulations which will ensure that investments currently held in child trust fund accounts can retain their tax-free status post-maturity. And the consultation will take place later this spring and the government will lay regulations before, before the House well in advance of the first accounts maturing in September 20. So in summary, both junior ISAs and child trust funds allow parents and guardians to save on behalf of their children tax-free. People have the option to convert their child trust fund into a junior ISA, and we are working with providers to reunite dormant accounts with their intended owner. However, all remaining child trust funds will continue to enjoy tax-free status even after they mature. And I should add that the amounts that can be saved by young people in child trust funds and junior ISAs will increase by inflation uh, this April, uh, it's at currently £4,260 a year. I'd be very happy to give way. Thank the for, uh, thank the Minister for giving way. Uh, would the Minister... I, I honestly agree with my uh, honourable friend here that the system isn't working. Yeah. As a way out, would the Minister consider uh, a meeting with, uh, with, with, with people who have the sufficient knowledge, uh, and uh, I, I would include my honourable friend here, but perhaps Citizens Advice Bureau and the, the, and the Share Foundation to see exactly, and, and perhaps a panel of parents... Uh, to see if uh, uh, some answers can come to the questions that have been raised. Yeah. I'd be very happy to, um, on behalf of my colleague, the member for Stratford-upon-Avon, who is the minister responsible in this area, who is currently before a select committee, to offer a meeting with honourable members to discuss this matter further, um, because you know, it's his responsibility and he, he'd be very happy to do that, I'm sure. But um, you know, the point I want to make is that you know, the efforts that we've made provide young people with savings to draw upon as they reach adulthood, and we hope encourage further stage, uh, saving at every stage of life. The Honourable Lady's uh, points um, concerning access, as I say, have comprehensively been met by the government's action in terms of that letter at 16. I understand she's not satisfied by my response, but as I say, I think uh, a meeting with a minister would probably be the best way forward. I'd be happy to give away. Will the minister take on board my suggestion of writing to the recipient of the child benefit when the person is 18? Because that is another opportunity when the government is writing to every mother across the entire nation, and that would be an opportunity for catching them in the net. I think the key point here is at what point does somebody have access to make investment decisions themselves as a young person, and that is when they're 16, and then they can access it when they're 18. I think sending 
uh, trying to overlap a letter with a with a mother when the actual it's about the, the, the beneficiary, which is the child, is is not the route to go down. But I think that the the best way forward would be for the honourable lady, who's clearly um, shaking her head and dissatisfied, to meet with my colleague from the Department for Education. Hope she, hopefully that will provide her with the answers she needs. The question is that this House has considered child trust funds. As many have been say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We can now come on to the next debate. I call uh, Gillian Keegan to move the motion. Thank you, and it's uh, an honour to serve under your chairmanship, Sir Christopher. I beg to move that this House has considered improvements to disability assessment services. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to debate this important topic here today. People with disabilities and ill health are often confronted with barriers at every turn. I believe it is the role of government to remove these barriers as often as possible. Everyone deserves the same opportunities to achieve their potential, and I am proud uh, that, uh, ensuring this is high, that, that we are ensuring that this is high on the government's agenda. The support available through the benefit system is there to take some of the strain off people living through often unimaginable day-to-day -day challenges. However, I am sure, like myself, colleagues have heard from constituents at times when they have needed help and found it difficult to navigate the system. A very dear friend of mine uh, and colleague from the business world, Andrew Noman, sadly lost his courageous fight with motor neuron disease late last year. He used his time and experience with the disease, campaigning to make sure I clearly understood the physical challenges it brought him and the challenges he faced trying to access the support available through the Department for Work and Pensions. And one of the most significant issues he brought to my attention was the repeated requests he received to attend work capability assessments. A point echoed by my constituent, Lee Millard, who has also been diagnosed with the same condition. Lee and his wife, Jean, have been campaigning to make a difference for those who are affected by the disease. When we met, Lee explained how stressful a reassessment process can be for claimants of employment support allowance, and now moving across to universal credit, and personal independence payments particularly when you consider that many conditions like motor neuron disease are degenerative and the person affected is all too aware they are not going to improve. He said that the whole process can feel very much like a waste of precious time. I'm very happy to give way. Thank you much. Thank you. Um, does my honourable friend agree that disability assessors should rely more on the opinion of medical experts, particularly when judging over mental health and invisible disabilities? Yes, I think it's absolutely vital, and I think perhaps one of the learnings of the system is making sure that those assessments are available in time as well, which is something um, I'll go on to cover. Um, the department, um, in a bid to tackle this problem, stopped requiring people with the most severe and lifelong conditions to undertake assessments quite recently from September 2017. However, some of my constituents explained that this was not their experience. They were still being asked to go for assessments. Um, I think my honourable friend here today, the Minister for Disabled People, kindly clarified that those receiving ESA and universal credit before the 29th of September 2017, uh, the severe conditions criteria would take effect at their next work capability assessment. So it could be that they've had one after that date, but after that, they won't have another. I also welcome the move to make decisions without face-to-face -face assessment, which is being encouraged through health questionnaires and evidence collecting uh, those from GPs and specialist health professionals. On a similar note, I'm pleased that people receiving the highest level of PIP will receive an ongoing award with only a light touch review after 10 years. This is another progressive step to ensure those who need support the most are receiving it hassle-free. Well, I'll way. give way and then... Thank, thank my honourable friend for giving way. Some of my constituents have found the assessment process uh, for both PIP assessments and uh, workplace assessment, capability assessments deeply traumatic uh, and can be very flustering and they often get, find they get very confused. Does she agree with me that the move to allow for assessments to be recorded, especially video recorded, will help to give that confidence to people that they truly are getting a fair assessment and that the assessors themselves are, are, are being um, monitored and having to come up to a high standard and that this is a good move? 
Yes, I, I do, and I think technology in general is enabling a lot better processes to be put in place. I mean, not for everybody. There'll be some people for whom that won't be appropriate, but for, to be able to use that technology um, in, in the right, on the right occasions is, is, is important. I give way to the Honourable Member. Sir Christopher, I, I, I thank the Honourable Member for giving way. And perhaps, Sir Christopher, I should declare an interest at this stage in that my wife is disabled. What I'm interested in is the assessment that takes place when somebody moves from DLA to PIP. And I've noticed a trend in my constituency surgeries. It seems to be that the mobility element that was in DLA is somewhat low when it comes to PIP. There seems to be a pattern here. I would ask the Honourable Member to consider, is this a pattern that's more widespread in the UK? And is there something here that's not right? Because notwithstanding leaving out my wife in this issue, I do have cases where I think people have lost out on, on the initial assessment. The sentiments about continuing assessment is absolutely correct, and I support that. Um, I don't know if, that I'm in a position to see an overall pattern, although perhaps the Minister will see that because she, she sees across the country. But I do know that there are issues with um, mobility, and in particular motability, which I think many of us will have heard about. Um, I am also pleased um, that those people receiving the highest level of PIP will receive an ongoing award with only this light touch review after 10 years. And I think it is most important that we take a pragmatic step to making sure that those who need the support are receiving it hassle-free. Uh, the Secretary of State's announcement last week went further. Um, people over pen state pension age will no longer have to go through PIP reassessments, and this is all part of the Secretary of State's ambition to ensure that disabled claimants don't feel like they are on trial. Sir. These changes have been rightly welcomed in the press and I'm sure by many members uh, in this room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These improvements are good news for claimants. However, one of the most common requests for help I receive from constituents claiming disability be benefits is, that when they do, is when they do not agree with the outcome of their assessment. So recent figures show that uh, at Tribunal in my area, Chichester, there have been 71% and 81% overturn rates for ESA and PIP, respectively. It is my understanding that this is largely due to medical evidence not being available in good time, and this only being made available at tribunal. Um, these levels are clearly unacceptable and very stressful for those people who have to go through the initial assessments and reassessments and tribunal. And I'd be grateful if the Minister could uh, let us know what more work is being done to improve the system, and in particular, if there are any plans to, to consider the timescales that we're asking GPs and medical professionals um, to uh, you know, give information about cl claimants and make sure that it's in time for their assessments. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank the Honourable Lady. Thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. I think it's, uh, it's a common experience that we all have that, that appeal rates are uh, unusually high. Um, what experience does she have of the, of the actual time it takes to get to an appeal? Certainly in my part of the world it's, it's 40 plus weeks which for, for some of these people is just a, a ridiculous amount of time to wait. Yes, it can be quite a long time and we've heard across the house of three months, four months and people waiting um, and with that uncertainty it's very difficult um, to plan if you don't know exactly how much support you're going to be receiving. Um, Yes, very happy to give way. Thank you very much. And she's making an excellent speech, putting into words what a lot of us experience in our own constituencies. In my area, it takes 48 weeks for an appeal to be heard. And people are having to sign on, usually for universal credit rather than ESA. They're having to undergo conditionality, even though, as you say, 71, 72% in my area of people um, find that they're not able uh, to work at the end of that, but they're being pushed into it by a system that doesn't take into account their disability at all. Does the Honourable Member agree that that's something that desperately needs looking at when they have to wait a year or more to get assessed properly? Uh, yes, I do. But I think actually the root cause of the problem is what we need to solve so that we don't have these high uh, tribunal rates. Because if we don't have them, then we won't have the waiting times. I think actually that is the best way to make sure there's a system that more correctly, uh, you know, that has very, very few failure rates in it. I'm very grateful. And uh, again, she's been very generous with her time. Is she as concerned as I am of reports that were in um, the GP journal Pulse last week um, that associated with the transformation of the new uh, assessment, uh, uh, health assessment system uh, could be the unfettered access to medical records via the GP 
Um, this is surely something that we should be speaking up against. It is a, an absolute human right um, that those medical records are that person's personal, uh, personal data. Uh, yes, although, of course, we need to get the balance between having enough medical data to make the assessments in the first place. So I think that's uh, balanced. But I haven't seen that particular report, but I, I, I don't know if the minister has and whether she can um, t you know, take that into account uh, in her summing up. Um, so following on from some of the recent government announcements, I am glad to hear that we are moving our benefit system into the 21st century by integrating these multiple data sets onto one system, although I take the, the, the Honourable Lady's um, point that we have to make sure um, that these are very well protected. Um, this will streamline the assessment process and make submitting a claim much more user-friendly, particularly for those people transitioning between benefits. Additionally, plans to test a single health assessment for all disability benefits will mean less form filling and face-to-face -face assessments will be reduced, essentially cutting red tape and the inconvenience this causes. My constituents who need support often have highly complex needs, so I hope these changes will save them time and stress. It is so important that we listen to our constituents to put them in the driving seat of future reforms, and I hope that the, the, the department is going to do that. One area that's been highlighted to me is people's reluctance to attend assessments, and I think we need to do more to make sure people feel comfortable with, uh, comfortable with and trust the process. Ensuring people know that they are in every case being assessed by a qualified doctor, nurse or healthcare professional, those also who often work in the NHS um, and have undergone additional training to carry out assessments is key. And I didn't realise this myself, that every single one of those assessments are carried out by a qualified medical uh, assessor. And I think many, many members of the public do not realise this. They think they're some third-party company, but actually they're not. They're often nurses that are working mm. for those companies. And I think we need to make, do more to make sure that people are aware of this and they may feel more... Comfort and trust. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Does she agree with me that we also need to, through this assessment process, make, make sure that these questions are not too intrusive so that people don't feel that their integrity yes. or dignity is taken away from them? So it's a process that they actually feel that they are comfortable um, with going and taking part in. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think on top of who is, is carrying out the assessments, I think we also need to look at opening up where the assessments can take place and maybe having a wider range of placements of places where um, you know and premises that we could hold assess assessments and those that are more familiar perhaps and convenient for claimants such as local authority buildings nhs sites or even job centers um, and i'd be interested to hear uh, if the minister has uh, any plans to do this in recent years we've seen disability employment rise and now over half of disabled people are in work Compared to 2013, there are now 9% more disabled women and over 6% more yeah. disabled men in work. And this is a testament to the programmes that are supporting people with disabilities into the workplace. Um, and I'm pleased to hear that the Secretary of State outlined her ambition to build on this record. As every person with a disability or learning difficulty deserves the same opportunity to go to work and to build a career. Existing programmes like the Personal Support Package have been crucial to this by providing tailored employment support that recognises the individuality of people's conditions. Much of this work is done through the Job Centre and in Chichester we have a great team who have some real success stories because of the support available through this programme. Our Job Centre Plus makes good use of the community partners and small employment advisors. Um, Chichester has a very low unemployment rate of 1.7%. So local businesses are very much looking for, well, looking to use all of the available talent and very much need um, more local people in the workplace. So I'm therefore that glad that the small employment uh, advisors are being able to bring people with long-term health uh, conditions and disabilities together with businesses um, to hopefully help them um, match and find a decent job. Work coaches and disability employment advisors are using all the tools at their disposal to help build skills and help disabled claimants prepare for the workplace. And they're doing this through national programmes like Work and Health, but also local initiatives like WorkAid that is being run by the Oldenborn Trust. It's great to hear the success stories of my constituents who've managed to move into work, and this is made possible by the tireless effort of the job centre staff who are making these initiatives a success on the ground, and I'm sure we all have many examples of this. Getting a good job has a powerful impact. Last year I met with a constituent whose son is on the autistic spectrum. 
And there's a big problem at getting people with autism into the workplace, and much more needs to be done on this. She told me how he rarely utters a word and he's very uncomfortable around people. She was determined to help her son and she managed to get him a work experience at a game software development firm. And this was transformative. For the first time in a long time, he began to speak. Um, and getting a foot on the career ladder is challenging, irrespective of disability. And sometimes extra special effort needs to be made to find those opportunities, and particularly uh, work experience opportunities as well. I'm very pleased that the Job Centre is getting now into schools to offer career advice to disabled students, uh, as building confidence in disabled children as early as 12 years old is, is going to be critical to, to making them feel that they have all the opportunities that everybody else has. But this is just the start. There are some exciting pilots up and down the country, like TriWork, that offers work experience for years 10 and 11, as well as others that support uh, internships for school leavers. And I want every disabled child to be uh, excited and have a wide range of options in the workplace. And we need to make sure that these initiatives are available throughout the country and not just down to individual initiatives. Um, these schemes are empowering um, young children, but they need to be available to all. Another successful programme is the Disability Confidence Scheme. Um, now with almost 10,000 signatories, one such employer is Chichester District Council, and they are working hard to make sure that their work environment is accessible. There are visible workplace adjustments, we have ramps, lifts and an emergency evacuation chair. And on top of this, and perhaps more importantly, they have a very welcoming workplace culture. They actively work with applicants to apply and will always interview disabled applicants where they have fulfilled the basic role requirements. This additional support removes the barriers to the workplace for disabled people and gives them confidence to start um, this journey um, into, into a new job. We all know from our constituents that the system isn't perfect, but I am pleased that the government and the Secretary of State is listening to their voices and reforming it. There needs to be less stress, less wasted time and less red tape all round, a more welcoming environment and one that makes people feel um, that they can trust the system and not feel like they are on trial. However, I am proud of this government's record in supporting disabled people into the workplace. There is still a long road ahead to ensure all disabled people who can work and want to work get the support they need and the opportunities that they deserve. Thank you.